I'm with Rochelle Weitzner, a beauty industry veteran who ran or helped run brands like Erno Lazio. Ah, I got to screw that up. I'm going to do that later. I'm with Rochelle Weitzner. It's so good to talk to you. We already started talking and then it was so good. I'm like, I have to record it. I have to record it because you're the OG. And how could you be an OG in 2019? When you're talking I know, about right? It's isn't that crazy? And how could I be an OG uh, around menopause and <laughs> talking about menopause and skincare and beauty and just menopause in general too? Like, I'm not the first one to go through it, right? I mean, it was crazy, crazy. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, I was happy to be, you know, that that first voice out there and now, you know, continuing to lead this whole endeavor around bringing education as well as, as products and resources and tools to, to women everywhere. So you were at Stacey London's uh, CEO summit. That is something really interesting. You know, I, I can't imagine a group of men doing that. Maybe they, maybe they do do it and we don't in some secret society uh, where, where they sacrifice something. I don't know, but was that, <laughs> what did you think when you first heard that she was doing that? She was gathering CEOs of compete. You're, you're basically com competitors. Yeah, yeah. So Stacy and I are good friends. And, um, you know, we've been talking about it for a while. And I thought it was genius, because how else are we going to really be able to come together and get our voices heard? So, so something that, you know, probably your listeners don't know, and maybe you don't know this either, is when I launched in 2019, there were so many headwinds that I faced. And what do I mean by that? Well, for example, um, you know, I used to be the CEO of Erno Laszlo. I was the CFO of Laura Mercier, Raviv. I knew the beauty industry. And so because of that, all of the, um, the, the press, right, the key magazines, the editors of the magazines knew me. They knew me from my past role. So when I told them I was starting this company, Pause, to, you know, focus, um, focus around women specifically experiencing the three stages of menopause and the skin changes that follow, you know, I met with every single editor or talking Vogue, Marie Claire, right? You name it. I sat down with them and they all said, great that you want to talk about this, but we don't write about menopause and we definitely don't write about menopause and beauty together. We don't want our reader to feel bad about herself. So we don't talk about it. So that was one thing, right? I wasn't going to get any coverage from the press. So, okay, so what do you do? How do you get your brand known and out there if nobody's going to cover it? Well, I decided to go the, the home shopping route. And, you know, there's probably one big player there. We know who that is. And I sat down with them and said, you know, I'm launching this brand. It's right in your customer demographic. I think it would be amazing to be able to speak to her in her living room about something that, you know, maybe she's not yet totally comfortable talking about, because let's face it, menopause, even now, is still a taboo subject. Um, so let's make sure she's comfortable when we're talking about it, because I like to educate too. And their instant response was, great, this is amazing, let's exclusively launch together. And then the lawyers got involved. And then it was, um, yeah, menopause is a medical condition and we can't talk about it on television. So thanks, bye. Now, there's so much wrong in that statement, right? Menopause is not a medical condition. It's a life stage. Every woman who's lucky enough to live long enough is going to go through it. So we're not all sick. I mean, that's that's crazy. You know, this was some some group of of lawyers that were likely, you know, men deciding, oh, all these women are sick and have this medical condition and we can't talk about it. Um, so, you know, the the idea that Stacy wanted to bring everyone together so that we could collectively share our voices, share our experiences, and quite frankly, the the pain and difficulty that we've been experiencing. I mean, to this day, Google still classifies menopause as a medical condition. And so because of that, we can't remarket skincare products to our customers. So many women out there don't even know that all of these companies exist because we, we're, we're censored. We're censored like, like we're, 
you know, I don't even know what porn or something. <laughs> yeah. Like sex toys. So, so explain that to people who don't understand when you say you can't remarket, what does that look like when I'm Googling menopause skincare? Yeah. So when you're Googling, you'll find some information out there, but let's say you, you find your way to my site, right? You end up on pausewellaging.com and then you leave. Um, what a lot of companies will do is they will be able to remarket to you. They'll show you, you know, some, some ads from pause or something like that. We cannot do that for any prospective customer. So it's just a way to, you know, to stay relevant and to keep your products top of mind. Um, I'm sure you've had that before. Like you visit a site and then suddenly it seems like they're following you everywhere. That's what I mean by, by remarketing. Mm -hmm. That so that is basically yeah you're censored because no you know that would remind you this happened to me loads where it's like oh yeah oh yeah and then maybe four or five times and you're like yeah I'm gonna go back there that's Sorry. crazy that's crazy um so when you face those barriers you you face the media coverage you face no home shopping uh were you in the middle of launching it or were you still in the idea stage and and what you know how did you move forward like why didn't you give up. <laughs> That's a, that's a great question. And I can't tell you how many times and how many tequilas I ingested thinking about, do I continue? Do I give up? What do I do? Um, so I had actually launched and um, I launched in June of 2019. And the whole, the whole uh, impetus for me to launch the company was me experiencing my first hot flash, which actually happened two years prior to that. Um, I was driving to the beach one day. I was in California at the time. I uh, started sweating to death and, and dying, and I thought the air conditioner in the car maybe was broken, and I was about to turn to my wife and start swearing about the air not working, and she was shivering under a blanket, and I realized, nope, problem, it's not the air, it's me, I'm having my first hot flash, and so in that moment, it kind of, you know, occurred to me that the beauty industry, of which I was a big part of, was not speaking to women like me, you know, at the time I was, I think I was 48, um, you know, experiencing this first hot flash and having no idea now what was about to come, because uh, I knew nothing about menopause. But I suspected that there were probably some very real physiological changes that happen. Um, so I knew I wanted to create a company around this, did, you know, two years of extensive research, scientific research, my wife is a doctor of physical therapy, a tissue and mobility specialist. And so, you know, we worked on some things together. We have a, a tool um, that's meant to stimulate fibroblasts, the, the cells that produce collagen in our bodies, because really what I learned from my studying was it was all about the fact that we lose collagen, we lose elasticity, we lose radiance, and we become excessively dry. So those are all the things that I'm really looking to address plus the occasional uh, perimenopausal breakouts, which are a whole lot of fun. We become teenagers again, right? Mm -hmm. um, but so so I had launched when I faced, you know, the, the media and everybody telling me no. Um, but I just felt like, you know what? I had to continue to persevere. And this was just too big and too important of a topic to um, pack up my toys and go home, right? Um, so I, I kept persevering. I found the most badass publicist that I could. Um, and she, uh, you know, she really helped me break through to the media. And now, you know, we are seeing menopause and beauty linked together. We're winning awards for our products. We're, you know, I was just recognized by uh, CEW, Cosmetic Executive Women, um, with Female Founder of the Year Award. Bobby Brown and I won that together. So, I mean, talk about being an amazing company, right? Um, so we're making progress, thankfully. And so this idea that now there's many companies out there, I'm guessing there's probably at least two dozen in the space, um, I think really... It does a few things. It legitimizes the fact that this is a very real category. It's a category in terms of health, wellness, and beauty. Um, you know, this customer, she she wants answers. She also has money to spend. 
Um, but she wants to be spoken to in a way that's that's direct and modern and you know, with that wellness focus around it. One of the things that I did was I, I trademarked the term well aging because I got so sick and tired of anti-aging. To me, anti-aging is, you know, we're against aging. Aging is bad. Well, I, I don't believe that at all. Um, so, so we talk about well aging, aging well on our terms, the way we choose to. When you're now, I mean, I think I just read you were quoted in Harper's Bazaar, like you're called up now to talk about it. Do you laugh sort of because they're all covering it now. And, you know, when I first got into it, I would see particularly the women's fitness magazines. They would always have these 50 year old women and they'd be talking women's health shape. They'd be talking about their wellness routine. And I'd be yeah. like, um, there's a giant elephant in the room here because you're not mentioning. But anyway, that's that's obviously changing. When you're called yeah. by these magazines now, do you have sort of like a little shout in for just a little bit of like, oh, hello. <laughs> I, I love it. I, I really, really love it. I love that, um, you know, we've been able to make change and make a difference. I mean, I, I will tell you that, that that major home shopping network that I talked about, you know, said to me in writing, our lawyers will never, ever change their stance on menopause being a medical condition. Now, I can tell you that uh, I am going to be moving forward on home shopping, um, you know, a, different in, in a different country, <laughs> but still, um, you know, things have changed and we have moved forward and there is a possibility to change minds and change beliefs and opinions and we really can make a difference. Um, I just wrote a piece for, there, there's an incredible digital magazine called The Pro-Age Woman. Um, if you don't know about it already, look it up. It's really beautifully, beautifully done. Um, it's you know really targeted for women 50 and up, but even if you're younger than that, it's, it's great. And I wrote a piece in the, in the uh, February, February, in the November issue that's called Speak Up. And it's really about, you know, using the power of our voice to, to make a change. So you did clean beauty. And one of the things I'm really interested in is how all of the things that we've been exposed to in our lifetime, all of the products that we've used that have chemicals in them that are in around us that we're inhaling that we don't even see that we don't even think about are impacting our menopause experience and because you went with clean beauty i'm wondering where your beliefs rest in that were you a clean beauty toxin free kind of person in your house before that like how did that come about and what do you think yeah i wasn't i wasn't and quite frankly the companies that i you know worked for prior to that also, we're not, you know, on the clean, the clean side of things. I think that through really just my own aging and my own wellness and, and research and, you know, for me, it started first with foods. I think foods were, were first and foremost to me, recognizing that what I put in my body um, ultimately, you know, ended up kind of everywhere, right, on my body in some way. And so I was very focused on clean eating. Um, I've always been a huge proponent of animal welfare and animal rights. So this whole idea of animal testing has always been horrific to me. Um, and so that was, you know, being a, a Leaping Bunny certified um, brand was first and foremost of importance to me. And I'm very proud of that. And then it just came down to, you know, really researching. As I said, I did, you know, several years of intense research and recognizing the, the endocrine disruptors and, and different potentials to impact the body in certain ways. Something else that's very interesting is that perimenopause, the first stage of menopause. So I don't know how, how well-versed your, your listeners are to menopause. Um, and how much you talk about it, but there are three stages, right? Perimenopause being the first, menopause itself being just one day in your life, one day that you go 12 full months without having a period, the very next day we're postmenopausal for the rest of our lives. But in perimenopause, where it used to be that women entered perimenopause, you know, in their sort of mid to late 40s, early 50s, Perimenopause now is happening around age 38 
it's earlier and earlier. And why is that? Is it, you know, the foods that we're eating and all of the, the hormones in foods and all of the other things in foods? Is it because more and more women are doing IVF treatments and those treatments are potentially aging the body faster? Uh, is it just general stress? So, you know, all of those things coming together um, for me just sort of led me to believe, you know what? Clean beauty can be very efficacious because that was the biggest thing is I didn't want to just create products for the sake of creating products. They had to do something. In this life stage, we don't give a crap about a nice marketing story. It's got to work. Um, so it was important to me, as long as I could create products that actually worked and were clean, that was positively the way I was going to go. And can you just speak to that a little bit? Because I know I have friends who still think that products can't work if they're clean, if they're made from plants. And I'm like, I don't, I think there's still a belief in some stubborn quarters that you need chemicals to treat your skin. Yeah. I mean, and, and the other thing I I guess I want to say is for me, clean beauty is not only plants. I believe very strongly that, um, you know, we can have some lab synthesized ingredients, um, Uh, take um, peptides, for example. Many peptides are not naturally occurring, but are lab synthesized, but are the absolute key for, you know, being able to improve, um, you know, lines and wrinkles and to really penetrate deep into the cellular level of the skin, which is ultimately what what we want to do. So, it's really about, you know, do, do we need formaldehyde in our beauty products? Uh, no, we definitely do not. And so understanding ingredients that have the propensity to really disrupt our, you know, our healthy systems within our body, that's what we're staying away from. That's also not to say that all plants are the greatest thing ever. Imagine, you know, a skincare made with um, poison ivy. <laughs> that probably would not be so great to to put on your skin. So not all plants are good. Not all lab synthesized ingredients are bad. It's really understanding that deeper science. The one thing that I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of dispute around preservatives mm-hmm. um, and particularly parabens. And I mean, I have to say that that parabens, I think, have really gotten a bad rap. I don't formulate with parabens because it's gotten onto that, you know, it, it's um, infiltrated our society to where parabens equal bad. Um, so I stay away from them. However, in terms of a preservative, they really are an incredible preservative. And so one of the things that you might find in clean beauty is that the preservatives that we are able to use, you know, we see color shifts in products. So maybe your product that was white, 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 when you, you know, first got it, maybe it turns a little grayish or yellowish. And that's just because of, it doesn't mean the product is bad. It's just that um, those clean products and the preservative level that you're using turning a bit in color. Okay. So why would you use formaldehyde? Why, why do people continue using those? Is it cheaper? Is it like, why? You know what? That is a great question. I mean, Obviously, it goes back to efficacy and what you're trying to derive from that product um, in terms of what the product can ultimately do for your skin. But, you know, with a bit of research, there are alternatives. And it's really just about finding those alternatives. I mean, when you think about it, if you've been formulating products for 30 years, right, and now to change a formulation... Um, it's a big deal. It's a it's a big expense. It's uh, it's a big deal to do. So, you know, I think that might be why some of the legacy brands are a little bit more hesitant to ultimately formulate clean. Um, but for me, it was just uh, it was a must have. It was something I needed to do when when entering the the game. And we're having so with the rise of the menopause of fifty, the midlife we're getting these skin influencers of our age now we're getting like um so there's a lot of people talking about skincare because people go crazy you know that they go crazy for skincare discussions but what do you see out there in social media that sort of drives you nuts because the thing about influencers is often there's like a very surface right like parabens are bad 
That's a, I, I heard a fact and I'm going to repeat it. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. I'm just wondering sort of what, when you're, when you're moving your, I don't know how much you consume, but what do you think people should be aware of and careful of? Well, so one of my big pet peeves right now, my biggest one, and I mentioned that I have my, this tool, my fascia stimulating tool. Um, and what, what I have a pet peeve about is right now in, in beauty, one of the things that's really being talked about is gua sha. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will call my tool a gua sha tool. Now, there's such a misunderstanding about what gua sha is and what it means. Gua sha itself is actually, it's a methodology. It's not a tool at all. Um, it's, uh, you know, from, from Chinese medicine, the definition of gua sha literally means scrape red. And to do gua sha properly, um, which typically is done on the back of the neck and on your back. The whole idea is you're scraping tissue with the idea of causing petechiae, which is bursting blood vessels, which leaves this red, uh, looks sort of like a red rash. I mean, if you Google gua sha and you look at images, you can see proper gua sha done where there are these red lines all over somebody's back. That's gua sha done the way it was supposed to be done, where you've scraped tissue. The whole idea is you're damaging that tissue with the idea of letting it repair itself. There is a time and purpose for gua sha. However, in my opinion, it is not on the face. Um, and so to call you know, my tool a gua sha tool and to even talk about performing gua sha on the face or you see these jade tools that are called gua sha tools, it's not correct. And so that drives me crazy. I say that, you know, what we do with our tool is the pause method. And that's where we do a series of very light up and down strokes. We do some very fast up and down and turning our tool 90 degrees and going side to side strokes. And the whole idea here is using very light, minimal pressure with the idea of creating something called shear. Shear is when we move layers of fascia across each other for the, the whole purpose of stimulating those fibroblasts, those cells that produce collagen that just tend to get tired over time and they, they kind of go dormant, uh, particularly when we're in our 40s and above, but they're still there. And if we can wake them up and have them resume collagen production, then you know, so be it. And that's what we're looking to do with this tool. So we are not scraping red our faces. We don't believe in that. We believe in, in the pause method. So I would just love for the industry to really get gua sha right and understand what it really is. It's amazing how many of these things are out there that are just going on and on and on. And there's like people like you just going, no, we need to stop it exactly. all. There's actually someone on Instagram called the muscle whisperer who does what you're talking about. And she always reminds me of you. Cause you have, I think you have similar hair. Like she's got spiky hair and yeah. I think her hair, her hair is gray. And it, like you have, you both have great hair and she's always like torturing people, but they love it and they come back and she's, she does it all over and she's healing them from all sorts of stuff. So if people want to see what you're talking about, that's on Instagram. I'm, I'm obsessed. If I ever go to LA, I want to have because I don't think there's very many people who actually do it but your thing is something different altogether <laughs> <laughs> okay so you uh you launched too with the sort of goal of being inclusive I mean you're very open you're married yeah. oh first of all can we just talk about two women how old is your wife two women going through menopause what is that like I don't I don't is that yeah yeah so my, <laughs> not my... to make a joke but it must be it must be something else no it's true my wife either just, I think she's about to turn 48. Uh, I'm 54. And um, yeah, it's uh, the, let's just say the air conditioner is constantly on. We, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of craziness. The brain fog can be crazy. We can't remember why we walked into a room. Um, but you know what, at least going through it together, we're kind of having those experiences and, and we can talk about it and you know, I, I call myself the menopause lady now. So because I have become just, you know, so aware. So anything that's happening with her, I'm like, yep, it's menopause. It's just another one of those things. You're, you're perimenopause. Just get used to it. <laughs> what about the, because I sort of think the symptoms and get overlooked, the, 
the actual soul shift, like, I think there's an actual soul shift, a, a mind, soul, spiritual thing that's happening. And I feel like it gets overlooked in all the discussions about HRT and symptoms and even skincare. I just wondered what, yeah. if you know what I'm talking about. If you've experienced what that's been like for you, I call it almost like a hero's journey. Like there's the calling and the dark night of the soul and all of it. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely, you know, mental health type issues involved for sure. Um, for me, the, the biggest thing that was, that I didn't really realize, and this is what I was quoted in Harper's Bazaar about was the whole brain fog and this idea that that was actually part of perimenopause. Um, you know, I really, for a while was wondering, was it early onset Alzheimer's? And, and then I was like, wait, the fact that I'm thinking maybe it's early onset Alzheimer's, does that mean it's not, am I actually okay? Um, so there was that there definitely is, a, you know, I think an awareness around much more around mortality and, and other things that come with this change in life. But I wanted to make sure that it was a time of, of really thriving and not, um, you know, not being miserable about it. And so I took a lot of steps myself to, I recently lost 42 pounds. Yes, it's possible to do that during menopause. You know, we think, oh God, I'm now I'm destined to gain weight and, you know, have hot flashes. Not everyone has hot flashes, which is great. Some people sadly have them, you know, forever. My mother-in-law, who's 81, still suffers from hot flashes. So, you know, um, it's definitely not all about a roses, but at the same time, we can do things to make the experience more positive for ourselves. And um, you know, I like to say now that menopause is actually our passage to power. It's the time in our life where we have the most freedoms, right? Probably kids are out of the house and, you know, we just have more freedom. We're the wisest we've ever been. And we just don't give a shit what anyone thinks about us. <laughs> like that is a definite, you know, mindset that shifts with, I don't know if it's 50, I don't know if it's menopause, but for me, being in 50s, um, I just really stopped caring what, what other people thought. Whereas, you know, early on, that was everything. You know, what what someone think of me? Can I walk out of the house looking like this? Am I okay? What does everyone think? I don't care anymore. Yeah, I noticed the other day that I don't ruminate and stew. Like I'm 52. I'm, st I'm not through menopause yet, but I my 40s was just filled with like stewing and ruminating and um, I, I just noticed that I, cause I was doing it over something for like an hour. And I was like, this is, hasn't happened to me in so long because I don't know, I guess you, it just, it's, it really is a freedom that comes. So if it's more yeah. and more and more like this, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm <laughs> exactly, exactly. And when the difficulties do talk, do come, that's when we just have to take, take a pause, right? yeah. <laughs> take our time and, you know, just kind of think about what's going on, take a breath um, reassess and, and figure out the best way forward because yes, not every day is, is a glorious, amazing day, but, but we can have them. What helped you? Like, did you go on HRT? Did you, you lost weight? You lost, did you decide you needed to lose weight to help symptoms? Like what sort of helped you? What did you do? All of it. So, um, HRT has been an incredibly important part of my life. So, I'm someone who suffers from PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome. And with PCOS, it's sort of like being in menopause your whole life <laughs> because I've had the, the hot flashes and night sweats for really 30 years. Not so much hot flashes, but night sweats for sure. Um, and I've had to be medicated just to, you know, through on birth control to regulate hormones. Well, you know, there comes that time when, you know, you need to get off of birth control and um, go on to something else. For me, HRT was just a, a given. It was something I was going to do. Um, again, doing some research there and realizing, you know, there was that study done in 2002 that just destroyed the world for women um, that basically said, if you're you know, doing any sort of HRT, you're more likely to get cancer. Well, that whole study was debunked, right? And, and figured out that that was just a terribly done study. It was not accurate. HRT is quite safe. 
the, you know, there are things you can do to improve safety. One of them being patch therapy, where the, um, the hormone itself isn't metabolized in the liver, but is actually applied topically. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of, of the patch along with a, an oral progesterone. Um, and that to me, that keeps me really balanced and, and centered and happy and, you know, all, all of those great things um, with the pandemic. So I was living in New York City when the pandemic happened. Um, my wife and I were in a teeny tiny apartment overlooking the Hudson, which sounds lovely, but we were looking down at the Comfort Ship, which was docked in, in New York City and the Javits Center where, you know, it became the field hospital and it was constant sirens and uh, it was awful, absolutely awful. We couldn't leave our apartment. And so we decided that uh, we needed to, to change our, our lives a bit. Uh, her family is from Vermont. We had family property in Vermont. And so we just decided to move out of the city. And now I live in Vermont, um, which is beautiful and wonderful. And part of me moving up here was to really start walking a ton and getting into shape. Um, and so that was, uh, I've, I've been able to get into the best shape of, of my life, actually, which is pretty fantastic. Did you do it mostly with walking? I did. I did walking and boxing. I love boxing too. Um, and so I, uh, I use a system called fight camp and, um, between that and, and the walks and, you know, here in Vermont, the, ter the terrain is very mountainous. Um, so there's a lot of, um, you know, you get a lot of challenges walking here versus, uh, you know, the flats of New York city. Yeah. Where I am, the flats of Abu Dhabi, I was just walking, wishing for some mountains. Um, yeah. Okay. So the inclusive conversation, I think you launched and said you're providing skincare for anyone going through menopause with a uterus, but I think yeah. you can go through menopause if you don't have a uterus, if you're a trans woman, I think if you have like lower your hormone therapy, I, I, I mean, I think it's possible. I don't know. Have you, have you, thought, have you heard about that? I am not sure what I, what I know. Um, what I do know is that when you are born with ovaries, right, it's, it's the ovaries that ultimately, um, lead to the, you know, menopause. And so without ovaries, I don't know. I do know that when ovaries are surgically removed, we are instantly thrown into postmenopause incredibly disruptive to, to a woman's body when that happens. She doesn't have the benefit of working her way up to it, right? Um, you know, we know that certain chemotherapy treatments, cancer treatments can also lead to immediate um, menopause. Um, so I say, you know, if you're born with ovaries, um, you know, this is something that you're, you're going to experience because trans men can... Um, will experience menopause. I don't know uh, enough about trans women to say for sure, just because they've, you know, been taking estrogen or, or hormone therapy, is that enough? I, I, I'm not a doctor. Not a of, There's not a lot of there. answer that. No. <laughs> there was just, I think just at the North American Menopause Society, they just had a presentation recently, and I'm going to track down that person who was involved in that research, because there's not really any research. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's just one of those things. Now, I have never had children, so I do find um, I'm sort of a, a lot, quite a bit of the conversation is not relevant or not, maybe not hurtful, just sort of, you know, there's a lot of it that's tied around having children. So I'm wondering, um, you know, for for queer people, like what sort of in the conversation, like where are you like, you know, like, where do you kind of get that thing where you're like, this is not you guys don't get it or you're not, I'm not fitting in here. Like I wonder. Yeah. What... Yeah. I don't fit into that either. Not having yeah. had kids and not really thinking about, you know, the end of womanhood now. Um, so that, you know, it's kind of, I'm going to say it's hard for me to relate to because I understand it. I understand, you know, what a woman might feel like, but I think um, it's more important to just think about this is not the end. This is a, it's a new beginning and it's a new time. And I like to really, I, I guess, focus on the freedoms, focus on the fact we can wear white pants anytime we want. <laughs> like, you don't have to think about that. 
Um, you know, you don't have to worry about getting pregnant um, when, you know, it's not planned for. I mean, so there's a lot of benefits to it too. Um, and that's what I prefer to dwell on rather than thinking about losses that might be. Well, I sometimes think if you haven't had kids that this, I mean, we'll never know, right? Because we haven't had them, but I do sometimes think there is an easier element to it. There, it, you know, there are things that are pro probably more difficult, but I think one of the things that might be a little bit easier is when you don't have children, you spend a lot more time sort of thinking about who you are and your place in the world. And like, I think you might have less of an existential crisis along with menopause because mm -hmm. you haven't been subsumed. Like, you know, I just have friends right now that are like, they've put everything into their kids and then it's just like when they leave for university. So I don't know. Sometimes I think, you know, I yeah, think maybe I think you might be right. You, you might definitely be right when you're really focused on your kids and then there is that time to focus on yourself. And that's most likely right when perimenopause is happening and, and it's probably a little bit of a wake up and yeah, it can definitely be upsetting. Um, I heard the term last week, meno washing. It was like the British um, Beauty Council. I think they had a discussion. It was the first time I heard it. That doesn't mean it's the first time someone said it, right? But um, uh, the CEO of the British Beauty Council said she was nervous about where the market was going and talked about things like true benefit from products and how that's difficult to get in skincare because it requires a heavy investment in uh, research and development. And I sort of wondered what you, since you've been in this space for a long time, what you thought about that. I think that it's true. I mean, not, I don't know about this term meno washing. I haven't heard that before. Um, I do think that, you know, where, where I come from is focusing on the science side of things. And um, I do do clinical testing on products um, for that, that very reason that, you know, I, I'm looking for that efficacy out of products. If I'm talking about something and, you know, my products are created to serve a purpose, not just to fulfill a line, you know, that doesn't really mean anything to me. Um, it's more about what is this going to do? What are the pain points associated with, you know, the, the skin changes with menopause, the ones that I mentioned, and then how can I address them? And, and what is my specific product going to do to address that? And is it efficacious? What is the science behind it? that you know, suggests and the proof from that clinical study that it is going to do what I say it does. I was talking about my, my fascia stimulating tool that I pair with our, we have a collagen boosting moisturizer. Collagen is kind of a big theme, right? And, and when I say a collagen boosting moisturizer, that doesn't mean I'm putting collagen into the product. Topically applied collagen isn't gonna do a damn thing for you. Ingested collagen, the jury is still out on that. We don't know. We don't know if that actually helps, you know, when you put collagen peptides in your coffee or what have you. It probably doesn't hurt. Does it help? Don't know. But what we do know is that um, collagen, you know, because the molecule is so big, it can't be absorbed into the skin. Topically applying collagen, not going to get you there. So we want to spark the body's own production of collagen. That is everything that we're about. Um, and so I've been talking this science since, you know, since I launched and decided that I needed to spend the money to do the clinical test. The money, the, the cost is really ex extensive um, and significant, but I wanted to prove it out. And so what we did was we did a clinical study where we had uh, women using the products, the moisturizer and the tool together for eight weeks, five minutes a day. And we had a measured improvement in skin density. So, you know, density being collagen of 24% after eight weeks, pretty significant, pretty significant. And so, you know, collagen is what gives us the structure to our skin. It's the support net of our skin. It's what kind of holds things up as opposed to when we start to lose collagen, things start to fall a bit and become a bit droopy and saggy. And that's what we want to avoid. At least I do anyway. Okay. So where do you see this going? Where would you like research and the direction of skincare and menopause to go? What's your sort of dream? Yeah, my dream is that this is very normalized into the conversation that we're no longer having to whisper when we say the word menopause the taboo is broken. This becomes part of normal day-to-day -day living. 
that there is much, much more research done into menopause and, and women's complete health um, experience around menopause. There, there's still so much work to be done. There's so much that we don't know. Um, you know, things like if a woman goes through early menopause, is that an indicator of lifespan? Does that mean she potentially will not live as long by going through early menopause? And if that is the case, and that's what we're seeing, we need to do something about that. So, so much uh, that still needs, needs to be done. Um, so that's really what I'm hoping. I'm hoping to propel the conversation forward to make sure that every woman from very young ages on is well-versed in menopause and what it means and how to prepare, even prepare yourself mentally for you know, what are normal experiences. I don't even like to call it symptoms. I like to say experiences because symptoms sounds medical to me and I want to veer away from that medical condition because it isn't a medical condition. Might we have medical implications as a result? Of course, but that doesn't mean that everyone in the world who goes through menopause is now suddenly, you know, struck with a medical condition. Well, it's interesting you say that because a, I'm on TikTok and sometimes the young girls will see my videos and say, well, I'm so scared. Like what? And I, I don't want them to be scared. All I want them to know is that there's something going on so that I, they don't spend their forties. Like I do like going to the doctor all the time. <laughs> and then there is this sort of narrow growing narrative. That's always been there that it's a deficiency, that it's a disease. And I too don't like the word symptoms. I think it's like sort of grasping onto this as some sort of illness. I don't know. Yeah. How do we carry that? Experiences. Experiences. experiences now, right? Yeah. 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 And you know, I it's so someone... interesting that you said in your 40s, going to doctor to doctor to doctor, there was a study that was done by Female Founders Fund that said women on average spend $20,000 only to realize they're perimenopausal. So think about, think about the savings that we could have as women if we just better understood perimenopause, what it's about and what it involves. Yeah. And then if those practitioners, because if one of those, what probably 13 people I saw had said something, then maybe I would have, you know, clued in. Although I do think that there was some denial on my part because I'm a journalist and I'm a health journalist. So I, should, I think I yeah. knew, but you know, like if your period's normal and you're like, nope, that's not happening. I thought, you know, if you, if you're scared of aging and all that, that's why I hope young girls don't can can get from this is like yeah we're still here we're still functioning we're still cool it's and badass and glamorous right I mean that's the other thing is we've got to stay badass and glamorous I don't look very badass and glamorous today but normally I like to well this is why all the new brands are so cool too because we are the the good design generation as well right like right. the purple and pink and flat terrible fonts like we were just all like I can't, I can't yes <laughs> I'm with you Okay, so tell me where you want people to go to find out more about your fascia stimulating tool, about your products, about you. Yeah, so our website is pausewellaging.com. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at pausewellaging. I actually do a TikTok myself, which is Rochelle Weitzner is my TikTok. And so you'll see me out there doing some, some crazy things. Um, I was posting for a while and then I kind of pulled back a bit and probably need to get back into it. But I think TikTok is where it's at. Um, I'm possibly going to go on to this new site, Flip, uh, Shop Flip, which is uh, all beauty. And it's one of these, um, it's sort of TikTok meets home shopping. And you uh, you do a live selling show. so. Could be very, very interesting. So we're we're in the process of getting set up there so I can talk all about menopause. And I, you know, I think it's probably a, a younger platform, but um, you know, we got to spread the word early. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank and, you so much. It's never too early to use, you know, to use my products too. There are no hormones. Um, so, you know, we talked about the fact that the line is clean, it's vegan, it's gluten-free, it's non-GMO, but it's also hormone-free. And that's really important because if a woman is 
you know, undergoing cancer treatments or has had cancer before, a lot of times you cannot have any sort of added hormones. You can't have anything you ingest, no soy products. And the same is true with topically applied. So it was important for me, any woman, no matter how she got to menopause, would be able to use my products. And that's why um, we formulate to be hormone free as well. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Thank you, Rochelle Weitzner. Check her out on TikTok and Flip. I'm going to check out Flip. I haven't heard of that. Thank you. Check out (laughs) Flip for sure. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Great talking to you.